Good evening. <laughs> Bonsoir, ça va? <laughs> I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for that warm welcome. It's, it's always lovely to be recognized, but there's a particular loveliness to being recognized by your own people. So, So this means a lot to me, thank you. I'm also really happy to be here um, now that AMPA has the good sense to have a woman as president. So, <laughs> so for all the men who've been president in the past, I mean, thank you, but hey. So, Congratulations, congratulations to AMPA on its 25th anniversary. Congratulations in particular to the pioneers of AMPA who started this organization 25 years ago. I learned a little about AMPA's work from two past presidents yesterday, and it was truly inspiring to see Nigerians working to improve Nigeria. Nigerians who recognize that no matter how successful a diaspora is, that success is incomplete without having some kind of impact in the homeland. AMPA's medical mission to Nigeria, AMPA's efforts are changing the obsolete medical curriculum, AMPA's aim of improving healthcare delivery in Nigeria, AMPA grappling with the many quintessentially Nigerian obstacles, all are inspiring and admirable. So congratulations and more power to you. I'm happy to be here today and I'm here in particular to honor two very special people who've been very important in my journey. My big sister, Ijeoma, and her husband, Obi. <laughs> they're, they're, they're also known as Dr. Maduka and Dr. Maduka, or as Americans call them, and as I sometimes teasingly call them, the Madukas. <laughs> Both of them are physicians in Connecticut and they're seated in front. My sister would be the gorgeous woman in black, and my brother-in-law would be the okay man. <laughs> when I left Nigeria to come to the US more than 20 years ago, it was a decision emboldened by my knowledge that Ijeoma was in America, and that I, at least I had somebody who would give me a bed and give me food. And she did that and more. And then she married a lovely, kind man. And both of them supported my early years here. When Ijoma was in Brooklyn, New York, being utterly overworked by the residency system, which I am now told has been made slightly more humane, <laughs> I lived with Obi and their son, Tokes, in Connecticut. And I watched Obi navigate midnight calls to the hospital and in the morning, I saw his eyes very bleary. And so I am familiar with some of the challenges of your lives as Nigerian physicians in America. And you would think I would have learned my lesson from living my early years in America with two Nigerian doctors, but no. I then went ahead years later and married a Nigerian doctor in America, <laughs> who by the way is not here today because he's busy working. <laughs> But his sister, my sister-in-law, Anthea Wandu, is here. And yes, she's also a Nigerian physician in America. <laughs> and she's seated somewhere, oh, there she is. <laughs> so I want to start by saying that I am almost one of you, <laughs> at least symbolically. But it was very nearly more than symbolic. I have a very clear memory from my teenage years I had just taken the, I had taken the junior secondary school certificate exam at the University of Nigeria Secondary School in Osoka, where I grew up. The results had just come out, and there were a group of us students at the school office to get our results. The previous year's best result was six A's. And in our year, it was 11 year A's out of 12 subjects, and I got the best result. It was... <laughs> <laughs> it, um, it, wasn't, it wasn't 12 A's out of 12 subjects, because that subject called maths 
had decided not to respect itself. <laughs> So a teacher, a teacher in the office, known, usually known to be very stern and undemonstrative, that day was beaming. She was very happy with me. She hugged me. She said I had made the school proud. And then a secretary then said, um, Adichie, which class will you be in in SS1? And the teacher turned to the secretary and said, of course she's going to be in science major. She's going to study medicine. I did not want to study medicine, <laughs> but I think we're all familiar with an education system that not only insists on conflating intelligence with the study of science, but also diminishes the importance of the arts. It happens in many parts of the, what is called the developing world. Young, bright students pushed into the sciences the girls and boys to medicine, the boys particularly to engineering, because it seems that apparently female brains can't deal with the rigors of engineering, <laughs> apparently. And there are many complicated reasons for this. Countries in Latin America, in Asia, in Africa, having thrown off the yoke of colonization, felt themselves in a race to play catch up in their journey to modernity. They took a very pragmatic view that to develop their countries, they needed to have practical skills. And these practical skills were often very narrowly defined as science skills. And this is understandable. But the mistake, I think, was in framing the science subjects as inherently distinct from the arts and giving value to one and not to the other. Because the truth is that every healthy society needs its scientists and its artists. But more than that, I now believe that that dichotomy is inaccurate, that science is in fact an art. <laughs> this is my sister here, I really love you. And something, something similar is happening today in this country. The US feels itself playing catch up to China and to certain countries in Northern Europe. And so a lot of the conversation is about the STEM subjects, as though it were STEM versus art, when in fact it should be STEM and the arts. So that teacher in secondary school represented a particular kind of pressure that I felt growing up. It was never overt or ugly, it was never about force, but it was a constant, subtle sense of what I was expected to do because I was at the top of my class. I did not want to study medicine. I never did. I wanted to write. I wanted to tell stories. I've been writing since I was old enough to spell, and I was deeply interested in the story of human beings in the world. Yes, I did well in the sciences. I liked chemistry quite a bit. I tolerated physics, and I found biology boring. <laughs> but I never really wanted to study those subjects. I didn't want to study literature or English either. I had always loved reading, and I felt that studying literature would stifle my own creativity. Instead, the subjects that really excited me were politics, how human beings organize themselves, history, especially narrative history, how human beings lived in the past, philosophy and theology, how human beings make sense of their lives. But I made peace with becoming a doctor. And I had it all planned out. I was going to study medicine and become a psychiatrist. <laughs> and during the <laughs> it, it was the only thing I found remotely interesting in medicine. <laughs> and during the day, I would work as a psychiatrist. And at night, I would write fiction, and I would use my patient stories for my fiction. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the plan. But one year into medicine at the University of Nigeria, and I found myself writing short stories at the back of my notebooks, and I decided I could not do this. So I switched to pharmacy. Why pharmacy? Because it really was the only thing I could switch to, considering my science track background. Now, one year of pharmacy, and I was so bored, so restless, so unfulfilled, so unchallenged. I felt as though my real life was waiting for me somewhere else. And that was when I decided to take the SATs, and I hoped I would get a scholarship and come to the US and study something, anything, that was not physics, chemistry, biology. <laughs> 
And this is where these two special people come in. And I want to say a public thank you to you, Ijoma Rosemary Adichie Maduka, and to you, Obinna Maduka, for being the kind of family that every writer needs. Always endlessly supportive, even if they didn't always understand my frequent and strange need for complete isolation. <laughs> the former US Poet Laureate, who is also a Pulitzer Prize winner, Natasha Threataway, an African-American woman who writes about race and other things, recently told me how, at an event where she was being honored, a white man came up to her and told her, well done, but don't be afraid to write about the big issues. Natasha and I both laughed at this story, but it was laughter with the quiet sting of recognition, of knowing that this kind of comment came from a particular patronizing impulse a need to diminish certain subjects in order to ultimately make them unimportant and easy to dismiss. Race is the foundation on which this country was built, and yet a talented woman writing about race is told that race is not one of the big issues. I have familiar stories, in my case about women. I've sometimes been told that, of course women's issues are important, but not that important. Or, that there are other more important things to talk about and to focus on. Of course, we should all have a, a hierarchy of priorities, but the question becomes who is making the hierarchy, what is being placed on top, and why? Ampa's theme this year is women's health in a changing world, and I think this is because Ampa realizes that women matter, and that women's issues are indeed one of the big issues. I'm told that I'm now considered a global feminist icon. And I never quite know what to do with my face when I hear that. I'm like, should I smile? Should I look serious? Should I? I'm... But I also like to joke about wanting somebody to make me a hat that says global feminist icon. But the truth is that I never intended to be a feminist icon. My goal was always to write, to tell stories, to live a life of the mind and a life of the imagination. But the success of my novels gave me a platform, and very soon I found myself being asked to speak at conferences that were not necessarily about literature. I was invited in 2009 to the TED Global Conference in London. TED Global is, is the central TED conference, and I was told that it was a big deal, that they don't usually ask writers to come, um, but one of the organizers had loved my first novel and so wanted me to come, that President Clinton would be in the front row, and so I went into a panic. <laughs> I looked at what other people had spoken about at TED Global conferences, and I saw that the people who spoke about Africa usually spoke about starting a school or building wells. And so, <laughs> And so I called, I was in Lagos at the time, I called my friends together in Lagos and I said, can we quickly build a well or start a school? <laughs> <laughs> so I can go to TED and tell them about this. Now sadly, we couldn't make that happen. So in the end, I decided to simply speak honestly about what I deeply care about. And so I gave a speech at TED called The Danger of a Single Story, which was about issues I had been thinking about. And that has been my guiding principle ever since. I speak about what I care deeply about. And whether it is received well or not, I sleep well at night. And I wake up with my integrity intact because I have spoken my truth. Yes. A few years later, a friend of mine was organizing a TEDx conference, a small independent TED conference. This one focused on Africa. And asked me to speak. And I told him I really didn't have anything else that I was passionate about. And he said, well, there is the one thing that you're always lecturing us about. And I didn't even realize that my friends thought I lectured them about anything. And so I said, what? And he said, women's rights. And I thought, well, right, okay, this is true. I am deeply passionate about it. And so I spoke about women's rights, and I called it, we should all be feminists. I was surprised by the success of that talk. And I don't think I said anything particularly new, 
I think it's because I told a story that many women recognized. And by telling that story, I gave flesh and bones to experiences that already existed in the imaginations of women. I brought a language with which women could talk about experiences that already were theirs. Hence, I am now a global feminist icon. <laughs> I was a feminist long before I knew what the word meant. I didn't read any feminist books. I simply watched the world. As a young child, I knew that the world did not give to women the same dignity that it gave to men. I was aware of how much the socialization of women was focused on men. Don't wear a mini, don't wear a mini skirt. Don't be out too late or you'll be raped by a man. Learn to cook and clean so you can keep a man. Don't be too ambitious so you don't intimidate a man. <laughs> don't, al <laughs> don't always say what you really think. Learn to pretend, shrink yourself, minimize your accomplishments and your intelligence so as to protect a man's ego. I genuinely didn't understand this. Why did we teach girls to aspire to marriage, but we didn't teach boys to aspire to marriage? And yet the girls, and yet, <laughs> I hope it's not only women who will clap. <laughs> but we, we teach girls to aspire to marriage. We don't teach boys to aspire to marriage, but the girls are supposed to marry those boys. And so it just seemed to me very um, strange. And I noticed also as a child how the same behavior was judged differently depending on whether it was exhibited by a man or by a woman. So a man would be called confident, but a woman would be called arrogant. A man would be uncompromising, a woman would be a ball breaker. A man would be assertive, a woman would be aggressive. A man would be strategic, a woman would be manipulative. <laughs> a, a, man, a man would be a leader, a woman would be controlling. A man would be authoritative, a woman would be annoying. <laughs> the behavior is the same. What is different is the body exhibiting that behavior. And so, and, so, and so I began to see that when people judged a woman for being aggressive or ambitious or annoying, it really wasn't the qualities of ambition or aggression that they were, that they were judging. It was actually women that were being judged. Now, because I'm a writer, I'm much more interested in story than in theory. Because story acknowledges nuance and complexity, and story shows that despite nuance and complexity, the underlying truths remain. And story, I think, is ultimately more persuasive than theory. We need to tell stories in healthcare. We need to tell new stories. And I think nuance is particularly important in healthcare. Our planet is in distress, and even if we don't want to sound apocalyptic about it, we know that the science is settled and that global warming is a real thing, despite what the president of this country might think. But, but the world's growing population is also part of that story. So if we take the desertification of, in sub-Saharan Africa as an example, arable land is shrinking, but the population is not shrinking. And so the number of people who will have to depend on this diminishing natural resource is increasing. This poses an existential threat for Africa, can lead to conflict. How do women come into this? Many of you here know about the work done in Africa about population, contraception. But it's really not just about making contraception affordable and available. The story is not complete if we talk only about giving women better prophylactic technology, if we don't also talk about giving women power. So let's talk, for example, also about the scourge of HIV AIDS. We know that for many parts of Africa, a risk factor for being HIV positive, a risk factor for women is marriage. It is impossible to effectively deal with this if we don't know the full story of women's lives, the complexity of women's lives, the story of individual women who ask their husbands to use condoms and instead get bitten up, 
who know that their husbands have multiple extramarital sex partners, but who, when they complain, are told to shut up and be grateful that he comes home to you at night. And who, because of the cultural formulations that have convinced them that they are incomplete without a man and without a husband, they stay in a marriage that is dangerous for them. They become HIV positive, and they have more children than they really want to have. And this is not just a story of poor, uneducated women. A friend of mine who lives in Lagos, who has a very good job, who's middle class, well-educated, and she sent out a survey, an anonymous survey, to the women working in her big telecoms industry, asking them what subject they most wanted a speaker to address. And the overwhelming response was domestic violence. And so we need to tell different stories. We need to tell stories with more nuance. We need to capture the reality of women's lives if we're to serve women well. To focus on storytelling is to recognize that cold-blooded logic that is disconnected from the complexity of humanity is often insufficient. Why do most of us here spend a large percent of our income on our children? The answer is love. Love is not logical, but it is a major driver of many human emotions and many human actions. Why would a Central American immigrant put her child in harm's way in order to try and bring that child to America? Love, promise, hope, desperation. These are not necessarily logical in the stark sense, but they are true. Lack of self-confidence is another driver of human actions. Culture is another driver of human actions. They might not always make a kind of logical sense, but they are part of the story. So when a woman is silent for 20 years about sexual assault and then suddenly tells her story, it makes no sense to apply bloodless logic to it and say, why didn't she go to the police the night it happened? Because human emotion is complex, and if we're to serve women well, we need to understand this complexity. And so when a woman is a patient and is clearly depressed and is in a bad marriage and her husband beats her and yet she defends him, it is because she has been raised in a culture that has taught her in big ways and in small ways that she doesn't really matter. And because it is a very hard thing to unlearn the lessons, the ugly lessons that our culture has taught us. But cultures change. Culture is never static. Human beings make culture, and human beings can unmake and remake culture. Some years ago, I was in my ancestral hometown, Abba, in Anambra State. Anybody here from Abba? <laughs> my sister. <laughs> um, I was in, <laughs> well, there's, there's somebody who raised, he raised this, and I'm not sure if he's actually from Abba, but we'll take you. And, my, and I, I, my father and I were having a chat, and then somebody came to visit us, and my father said to me, this man is actually um, a set of twins. He has a twin brother. And my father said, they are the first twins who survived the practice of killing twins in Igbo land. They were the first who survived in my hometown. This man was maybe in his um, mid-50s, I would say. And so I was shocked by that. I, I, and I, of course I knew about the culture of twin killing, but I hadn't realized how really relatively recent it is. And what it made me think about and what it, it brought home to me in a very particular way is how culture changes. This man was in his mid-50s, but for everyone in Abba, it's now perfectly normal and it would be completely inconceivable to kill twins. But only 50 years ago, that's what everybody did, and it was seen as normal, it was seen as culture. The point here is that we can change culture. If cultural actions and cultural beliefs are unhealthy for particular people, we need to change them. Recently, I received an honorary degree from Yale, which is also my alma mater, so it was my second degree from Yale, and it was very lovely to be there. But it was also a year in which women were celebrating 50 years of women at Yale. And that too shocked me. I hadn't quite realized that it's only been 50 years that women have been allowed to matriculate at Yale. 
And it's important because if the prestigious institutions in this country are really the gateways to, to power, to influence, and if women have only been allowed in for 50 years of the more than 200 years of these institutions, then when we tell the story of women and women's achievements in this country, we have to put that in context. But it's not just about the facts and the fact that women were admitted in 1969. It's also that the stories have to capture the subtleties and the nuances. It's not just that women are now admitted to Yale and to other Presti prestigious institutions, it is still about how they're put down and dismissed and made to feel that their contributions don't matter. Many women at prestigious colleges have stories of this sort. And so if somebody is talking about equality of the sexes and somebody says, well, women can vote now and women are at Yale, so there's no problem, that's not true because it's in the nuance of the story. The law has changed but the culture has not necessarily changed. And it is storytelling that captures this nuance. In Nigeria, for example, women can of course go to any university they want. Actually, more women than men are in universities in Nigeria today. But can we truly say that everything is fine and everything is the same? and that education outcomes are now equal, when we still have cultural formulations that can squash a woman's educational achievement, when educated women constantly have to negotiate how to seek their own self-fulfillment while also placating their husband's egos, when a friend of mine who is ambitious and in her 40s and educated can say in the year 2017, I want to walk, but my husband doesn't want me to walk, and so I stopped walking for peace in my marriage. <laughs> There's a lot of resistance to the idea of feminism. I'm actually not sure why, but actually I kind of know why. But, <laughs> but when we see something done over and over again, when we see men occupying positions of power consistently, constantly, it starts to seem normal. It starts to seem natural. And so when we then talk about women wanting to be in those positions, it starts to seem unnatural. When we say, for example, that women are people, it can seem revolutionary. Because what we're really saying is that women are more than their reproductive functions, that women have identities that are not relative to someone else, that women are more than just being somebody's wife or somebody's mother that women should be allowed to be many things, that women should not have to hide parts of themselves or do themselves a disservice to keep so so society happy. So we should change laws that diminish women, but changing mindsets is even more important. We should enact policies that support women, but changing cultural attitudes is even more important. And physicians like yourselves, because of your work, because of the prestige and the trust that your work brings to you, you've, you're in a particular position to start telling new stories about women. So women's rights will not solve all the world's problems, but we cannot solve all the world's problems without solving the problem of women's rights. Thank you.